Welcome to this ACCA paper 2, Clock Put Portain. So now let's see how we can succeed in the paper 2 exam. And I'm Steve, I'm the course director here for the APC. So in order to succeed in the paper 2 exam, we have to be successful in these three aspects. So first of all, we need to know our accounting standards really well so that we can quickly apply this knowledge into group consolidation and also a case study question which is your examiner's favourite in a, uh, in a question 2 as well as the question 3. So as we can see the accounting standards normally will appear not only in the question 1 in your paper 2 but also in the question 2 and question 3 in your paper 2 and the third component is that we need to know the current issues which is the changes in the accounting standards and how we adopt those changes to the new scenarios that will appear in the question 4. And as I said, there will be four questions in the paper 2. So question 1 will be the group consolidation. 50 marker is the compulsory question. And then question 2, 3 and 4 will be 25 markers each. You only need to choose two questions out of these three. Okay? So that's the exam structure of the paper 2, and the passing mark is 50, of course. So, within the accounting standards, here for the APC, we will divide those accounting standards into four different categories. Related to the asset standards, for example, you can think about the inventory, property plant equipment, agriculture, for example, the biological assets, financial assets, for example, intangible asset, investment properties, uh, non-current asset held for seven discontinued operations and also related to some other uh, accounting standards as well within the first one. And secondly, we've got the income standards, particularly dealing with the IFRS number 15. It's the new standard on the re revenue recognition and also the IS number 20 government grant. And also we've got the expense and liability standards, for example, the provision, and contingent liabilities, contingent assets, and also we've got the share-based payments, employees' benefit, income taxes. So those will be detailed that in the third category. And the fourth category is related to disclosure standards, for example, the fair value measurements according to the IFRS 13, and also some related standards and also conceptual framework. So that's the chapter uh, we are going to study related to IFRS. And once we've learned that, we quickly apply them into group consolidation into the paper too. For example, the uh, consolidated SFP, the consolidated PNL with OCI, and also cash flow. And also, we're going to cover the current issue, which will appear in the question for your paper two exam. So that's the, just to be the overall um, course structures that we've got. But the key to pass the paper two is to know your double entries really well. So, for example, the debits and credits, because in the paper two, we are the financial accountant. Remember, we are the financial accountant. We are not the management accountant in the paper two exam. So from that perspective then, if you don't know about your debits as well as the credits in the paper two exam, it's highly unlikely that the students will pass the exam. And also very, very importantly, you need to write out something in narrative to the examiner showing how we should cheat different scenarios using different accounting cheatment and also using your judgment as well. That's very, very important stuff. And in order to do this, in this sample video, what I tend to do is I'm go through um, a few cases to familiarise yourself with the style of the question that you may see in the upcoming city exam. So, the case number one that we are going to go through is related to the investment property. Your company is selling investment properties. So, selling those properties, as you can see, is the houses, the buildings, to people in your local country, for example. So, when you look at the investment property for the items that you are selling onto your statement of financial position, you know that property value is to be $10 million. But now you change your mind. 
you say to uh, the employees within your company, also your customers, we are not selling those properties to you anymore, but rather I decide to hold it on my own. Because I think by holding this property for another two years, the value of those property would rise up again and again because of the market condition. So if that's the case then, well, because of the management activity, for example, we decide not to sell it, but rather we should hold it. So if that's the case then, from the financial accountant's perspective, how are we going to record this transaction that have already taken place in the company? So first of all, we're going to think about the framework, conceptual framework. So according to the conceptual framework, we are going to see whether or not we're going to show this property as an asset. Yes, we looked at the definition of the asset in the element part within the conceptual framework. The asset is the resource that is controlled or owned by the business as a result from a past event. So that means this property belongs to our company because this building is built by our company. So that's what I mean by past event. And from which the future economic benefit will flow into the entity because our company is selling those properties. By selling out those properties that we can get the cash from a customer and then using this property, I mean by selling it, we can generate into future economic cash. And that's the result of it. Of course, we're going to show that as the asset. If the probability that we can receive those cash from a customer is greater than 50%. So, we know that we're going to show that property as an asset. So, let me put down here. So, within your SFP, as you can see, we've got the asset part within your balance sheet. I can call it the SFP. Of course, according to the IAS number one, we are keep referring to those accounting standards that we're going to learn. According to IAS number one, the presentation of the financial statement, we are following the principle-based approach. So that means we can call it as the statement of financial position or we can call it as the balance sheet. It's entirely up to you. So in this case, as you can see, because our company is selling those investment property, our aim is to sell. If that's the case, we are going to classify those investment properties under the current asset. You know that is the inventory. For example, ten million dollars. So, because our company is selling those investment properties, so we expect to sell those inventories normally less than one year, and hence the carrying value for that. Okay, is ten million dollars. But since our company has changed our mind, we're not going to sell it anymore. We decide to hold it on our own. So, from that perspective, because of a change in management activity, from the financial accountant's perspective. We should question ourselves. Well, we're not going to sell it. But rather, we're not going to sell it. We decide to hold it. And hence, perhaps we're going to think about, well, should we reclassify this investment property from the current asset section into the non-current asset? So, for example, in this case, as you can see, that the fair value of that investment property is $15 million. So what do I mean by fair value then? So fair value is determined according to the IFRS 13 fair value measurement. And hence the investment property according to the IFRS 13 is the non-monetary item. So if the investment property is the non-monetary item, how are we going to determine that fair value then? Well, the, the way that we're going to determine the fair value according to the IFRS 13 is first of all, we are going to see whether or not principal market actually exists. For example, whether or not there's a market exists where we can buy or sell the investment property quite easily. So if that's the case then, if that market exists, we're going to use that price adjusting for some of the transportation costs, which will give us the fair value. But if that market does not exist, for example, there's no market that you can buy or sell the investment properties quite easily, of course, if that's the case then, we are going to use the most advantageous market, or we can call it as most profitable market, to determine that fair value. Again, if there's no principal market, 
we're going to use the most advantageous market to determine that fair value using a price adjusting for any of these transportation costs, for example. So in this case, we are given that $15 million for the fair value directly. Of course, the determination of that fair value, we can use different ways according to IFRS 13. You can use, for example, the market approach by using some of the PE ratio. You can use the income approach, for example, you can use the present value of the future cash flows, for example. And also you can use the uh, cost approach, for example, determination of those replacement costs. Yes, we determined that the fair value for that investment property, according to IFRS 30, is $15 million. Okay, so if that's the case then, here's the question. Well, if you decide to reclassify your investment property from inventory to a non-current asset, the name for that is called the investment property. Here's the question. Either you're going to put $15 million as the fair value here, or $10 million as the carrying value, or you can call it as the book value, because that book value of that 10 has already happened in the first place. Because under the current assets, you can see, it's $10 million there. Either going to put 15 or 10, 8 or B, what do you think then? Well, think about it in this way. If you decide to put $10 million as the carrying value to the investment property, that you're saying to yourself, well, we are quite reliable. Because $10 million is our carrying value, that has already taken place. Because when we build that investment property before, the total cost related to it is $10 million, which have already been presented into the invoice already. So you take that figure and slot that into investment property. According to a conceptual framework, is faithfully representing the transaction. And this figure is quite reliable. But also you can argue that putting this $10 million may not be relevant. So, relevance means whether or not this figure will help the investor to buy or sell a share. That means whether or not that figure of the investment property will help the user into the investment decision making process. Well, if I were you, if I were to buy a company here, if I see, well, in your investment property is just to be $10 million, but look at the marketplace, for example, there will be principal market assists. Uh, there will be lots of these similar investment properties outside the market. They're actually worth 15. But your company's investment property is just to be 10. So if I were you, I would not buy this company's share. Because I think, well, perhaps this investment property, its value is not very good. And its quality is not very good. So I'm not going to buy this company to hold this investment property on my own. So that's the uh, answer for this. So that means what we need to do is where we're going to use the fair value for this rather than the carrying value because in this case, relevance concept wins against the faithful representation according to the conceptual framework. So if that's the case, as you can see, how we're going to record this transaction from the accountant's perspective is where we're going to credit the inventory worth of $10 million related to those properties and then we're going to put that by debiting the investment property worth of 15. As you can see we need to know our double entries really well because the debit is greater than the credit. Okay, So what we need to do then is the balancing figure for the credit side, we're going to put that into the accounting gain of this reclassification of $5 million over here. So of course, when we are preparing for the consolidated statement of financial position later on, if this is related to a parent's company reclassification, we're going to put that gain into the returnings, normally into working five. Trust me, my way to consolidate the financial statement is quite easy for you to follow and it's quite powerful as well. 
if you understand that, if you use that pro forma, of course, you can do the consolation question very, very easily. And if, for example, if you are required to prepare for the consolidated statement of cash flow, that $5 million of the accounting gain needs to be eliminated in the non-catch item adjustments as well. Okay, so that's just one example of how the case study in the paper too, uh, you may see in the exam. So another practical example related to this is related to the basketball club that I've given you here. So this is an example of the examiner to test the non-current asset within your paper two exam. So within the non-current asset section, we know that when we are preparing this statement of financial position, we are following the accounting equation, which is the asset equals to liability plus equity. So assets can either be non-current assets, which is more than one year and used by the business, or it can be current asset, for example, inventory, cash, receivable. So we are talking about non-current asset here. So this case is all about the basketball club and you buy a right from that basketball club because basketball club sells tickets for different competition uh, related to basketball. And then you buy a right to enjoy 20% of their ticket sales. So that means if you think about it in this way, so for example, here's the basketball, B for short, and if they've sold $100 worth of ticket sales, because you buy a right to enjoy 20% of them so that you can enjoy $20, you agree? Not a problem, but it is just to be a right to enjoy those sales. So that means if they haven't uh, got any sales at all, for example, zero, so that means 20% times zero, so that will give you zero money. So here's the thing. You sign contract with that basketball club over here to enjoy that 20% of the ticket sales right. So from your perspective, because you bought that right, so here's the thing. The right is just to be a right. A right we can't touch. We can't touch that right, right? because it's stated into a contract only, we can't touch that right. So from your perspective, you may have a series of questions. For example, either we're gonna present this right as the intangible asset, because we can't touch that right, or we're gonna put that into the property plant equipment. If we were to put that 20% of rights to enjoy the ticket sales within the property plant equipment, it's not correct because property plant equipment is related to your land and buildings and machineries. Well, that's not correct. But what about for the intangible asset? Well, intangible asset, think about it in this way then. The, we, are, we are keep referring to the um, conceptual framework. So let's remind ourselves of the definition of the asset then. So the definition of the asset is the resource that is controlled or owned by the business. Yes, we bought that right and we signed a contract already. As a result for a past event, yes, we signed that. We did sign that already. And from which the future economic benefit will flow into the entity. If we were to use that right, we cannot guarantee the future economic benefit will flow into the entity because as you can say, we are entitled to 20% of those ticket sales only. We can't guarantee that they can, they can sell the uh, tickets to different customers because we haven't got the right to govern their, um, I mean, for example, govern their decision-making process. For example, how you're gonna set up the ticket price. Are you gonna set up at $5 or $500 or $5,000? I mean, it's entirely up to that basketball club. You only got that right. So from that perspective then, it may not be quite appropriate for you to classify this as the intent of asset because it is not more than 50% of chance that you can get those benefits because you haven't got the power to govern their decision-making process. 
So close to ice number 38 in Tan Tsubasa set, although this contract is identifiable because it's a set put contract, I mean, it does not quite meet with the asset definition here. And also, you cannot reliably estimate, um, I mean, the benefits that you can get uh, as a result of it. So it may not be quite appropriate for you to classify this right as the intense asset. So here's the thing. Perhaps you're going to refer to the IAS number 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, or contingent assets. To put it simply, for provision, it's the liability. So for example, you estimate that you will pay for $300 tomorrow. So you're going to provide for a provision now by debiting the expense and credit provision worth of $300. Okay, that's the provision. We also talked about the contingent liability normally in a court case. For example, I'm suing you and your lawyer says to you, perhaps you will have, let's say, 40% uh, of chance that you're going to pay for me uh, the compensation. So if that's the case, you're going to disclose the contingent liability into your account. So that's associated with the court case normally. And also we've got the contingent assets according to item number 37. As you can see, uh, the contingent assets is the number two, yeah? So contingent asset means either we can get this asset or we can't get this asset. So that means in this case, slot that here, either we can get that 20% of sales if they can sell it or we don't get it because if they don't sell it, for example, they don't uh, make uh, they don't make any sales revenue at all. So if that's the case, well, that seems to me is quite close if we were to disclose that as the contingent asset. But the contingent asset, I mean, it's not quite suitable in this case, but you can justify it. That's the contingent asset. But from my perspective, it's not a contingent asset because the contingent asset normally is also referring to a court case. Is the asset will be dependent upon a certain uh, events may happen or not happen. Uh, I mean, related to those possibility of the cash flows. So, I mean, by disclosing this 20% of the ticket sales rights as the contingent asset, that's not faithfully representing the transaction. Because if you disclose that as the uh, contingent asset, from the understandability perspective, according to the conceptual framework, because from a user's perspective, when we read those financial statements, we've got lots of experience in doing that before. We've looked at the contingent asset, normally related to a court case, and now we disclose that as the contingent asset. Well, perhaps to me, it's a little bit of a misunderstanding. It confused me quite a lot, really. So from that perspective, then, it's neither intangible asset nor contingent asset in this case. But what is the answer would be, then? Perhaps from my perspective, we should recognise as the financial asset according to the IFRS 9. Because the financial asset means we've got the right to receive some benefit from another party. So as a result of it, it may be more appropriate for you to disclose it and recognise it as the financial asset rather than the intangible contingent asset there. So, as you can see, this is a style of a question that may pop up in the exam. So very, very importantly, you need to know the definitions of each of these uh, elements within the accounting standards and also need to know about the treatment related to those as well. If you know this and also you keep referring to the conceptual framework, no problem for you to pass the paper two in the upcoming sitting, trust me. Okay, so we learned those accounting standards already. We've seen those quite a few examples related to those, and we keep referring to the accounting standards as we've seen before. And now let's put that into the consolidation then. So for the consolidation, unlike in the paper F7, we know that in the paper F7 is the simple consolidated financial statement. And of course, in the paper two, those adjust, uh, adjustments, those workings, will continue to be tested in the paper two exam as well. So that's just to refresh our memory. 
relate it to those conservation part basic knowledge through this example here. So as you can see, the conservation is one company buys another. And if that company becomes your subsidiary or becomes your associate, what you need to do is going to put those figures into your financial statements. If there's a subsidiary, put that line by line. Adding up the asset together, liability together, and we're going to split the equity between the parent and the subsidiary, reflect it into the NCI, which is the non-controlling interest. If that's associated with the associate, on the other hand, what you can do is going to use the equity accounting. You only account for the percentage of shareholdings that you've got over that associate related to its profit the tax only. So as we can see in this example, that our company buys 100 share, 100% of shares in B company. So within the B company's account, within its SFP, for example, it has got a um, 1,000 shares. If we buy 100 of them, that means we buy 1,000 shares in total, and that's it. We spend $100 to buy it, and their company, and their asset, which means the equity, is $70. So that means if you look at its financial statements, you can see that the total asset minus the liability will give you 70. So that becomes the equity. So if that's the case then, that becomes your subsidiary and you are the parents because you control that subsidiary. And as a result of it, in addition to plussing all of its asset liabilities together, for example, your PPA, property plant equipment, is $10, and their PPE is $5. So in a group conservation financial statement, 10 plus 5, that will give us 15. So on top of doing these adjustments, what we need to do also is we're going to cancel the money that we spent in buying your $70 worth of net asset. So that means we have to decrease our $100 from the group financial statement's perspective. And also we're going to remove your net asset worth of 70 so let's see then. So in this case, what we need to do then is that we've spent $100 to buy your equity or net asset at the date of acquisition is worth at 70. So we spent $30 more to buy your equity. So that $30 or more, we're going to call it as the good one. We're going to put that into the non current asset within the constituency SFP. So the balancing figure is called goodwill. So that means it's just to be a balancing figure. And that means if you were to do this, for example, all you need to do um, is where you are going to put that here, for example, the T account. For example, you spend $100 of cash and then your net asset is 70 we We've bought it originally. So the balancing figure for this will pay here and that will be the good one. So it's just to be a balancing figure as a result of a series of transaction, we're going to put that into the non-current asset within the CSFP. So that's the basic um, consolation that we need to refresh our mind. Okay? So uh, and in the paper two exam, there'll be quite a few complications that comes in. For example, what if, if we were to buy 60% of shares rather than 100%, of course, in this case, we have to recognise the non-controlling interests for those shareholders who do not control the company. And how are we going to account for it? We use two ways to do that. And also, what if there's a change in ownership? For example, initially we bought 60%, but now we buy another 20%. And of course, from the individual financial statements perspective, we are showing this as the investment in equity instrument according to IFRS 9. But from a group's perspective, 
what we have to do is you're going to account for the changes in the ownership, changes in the equity. We are going to record them as well. For example, if we were to buy another company, okay, on top of us, we've still got the parent's company. And how we're going to consolidate that sub subsidiary into the parent's company, that's referring to as the complex group. And what if there will be a foreign subsidiary? So that means the shares that we've bought in that company, that company is located into a foreign country and hence denominated in the foreign currency. So how are we going to retranslate them as well? So those are the things that we have to cover in the due course. That's the P2 stuff. Okay, hope you're happy. So how APC can help? So we provide for the ACA P2 course, including the live online driven course. So we will provide the interactive virtual classroom tuition and revision course, such as this sample video, me talking to you, and you can see the screen clearly, it's like in a real classroom. And of course, it's a live online driven, so that means before you start watching these uh, videos, watching this virtual classroom course, related to tuition and revision, you will have the tutor live online guiding you what sorts of things that you need to do, how to set up your study plan, and how you're going to answer questions in a very, very efficient manner, for example. So those will be quite valuable to your exam success, and also will provide for the mock exams uh, be just before the exam, and giving lots of tips to you, and then do it under exam condition, and send that to me, send that to our tutors, of course, we will mark it for you with the individual improvement feedback. And after all, we've got the tutor support as well. So during uh, your study, any questions, we will answer your questions. You can email us directly. I will provide you with the answer shortly. So thank you for joining us for the Paper P2 journey. I hope you find this course useful and also interesting. So look forward to seeing you in the actual class. Thank you. APC, accounting for your future.